He was a morbidly obese surgeon destined for an operating table and an early death. Now he's a rebel MD who is fabulously fit and fighting to make America healthy again. This is Stay Off My Operating Table with Dr. Philip Ovedia. Welcome back, everyone. It's the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast. Dr. Philip Ovedia, I'm Jack Heald, and we are joined today by Suzanne Alexander, whom I did a wee bit of, of research on. But I don't think I've been able to figure out a whole lot about, well, I, I don't know much yet. So Phil, set the table for us. Yeah, this uh, is going to be another great conversation. So Suzanne is co-author with Dr. Chris Kenobi, who we had on recently on the fabulous book, The Ancestral Diet Revolution. I got it right over my uh, left shoulder there. And Suzanne and Dr. Kenobi are about to set off on a pretty exciting expedition, <laughs> truly an expedition. So that's the main reason I wanted to get Suzanne on, hear all about it, hear about the great work they're doing. But with that, I do know Suzanne has a very interesting background. So I'd like her to kind of tell our audience who she is and how she got to where she is about to set off around the world. Oh, first of all, guys, Jack, Phil, thanks so much for having me on. This is just what a gift. And you guys are such a treasure to this world. And thank you oh. for all you're doing. You're just so oh. appreciative of all. This has been a lifelong journey, 62 years worth. And I was born into like the perfect family. God placed me into the most perfect family. My father has PhD, his doctorate from Columbia University. And this is a little indication of the kind of man he was. And when he was there working on his doctorate, we, he moved all of our family there. And I was a little girl, I was four. So I attended Columbia University in, in the nursery school program. <laughs> but anyway, he would sneak into the labs where they were doing research on the mice and the rats. And he'd bring them home, those that were dying. And we would nurse them and hopefully survive, help them to survive. But they mostly didn't because they were just so riddled with cancer. But anyway, so then when we moved back home, um, his life was, yes, he was administrator at our school district, but he also was a wildlife rehabilitator. And so we would um, raise wild animals until we could return them back to, to nature. And they basically became my family because as, from as far back as I can remember, they were my family. They were my brothers and sisters. I was part of their litter. And um, they taught uh -huh. me everything. They taught me how to climb trees. They taught me how to live. They taught me how to live in nature and how to eat. And I marveled at them. But my father and I were both very sick as well. I inherited most of his illnesses and diseases. And some of them genetic and some of them not. And I would always question him, why am I so sick? Why are you so sick? Why are we in such pain all the time? And my grandmother, also, I was born into another, she was part of our, our clan. She also lived with the natives and tribes in Liberia and Nigeria for three years. And she taught oh. there in their tribes. And when she would come home, I would sit at her feet and I would just say, tell me everything. And she had all these slides that she would take of them. They were so beautiful and they were so healthy. And she'd tell about the food that they would eat. And I would just marvel because it wasn't what we were eating. I was eating Captain Crunch and drinking Tang and all these awful food. <laughs> it wasn't really food. And every time I ate, I was on the floor in such pain. I didn't understand why I was so sick. And so finally, about 10 years old, when I would come home and my father would say, when you come home from the library, would you bring home, whether we had raccoons or foxes or skunks or whatever our animals that we were raising, bring home books so we can learn about their species specific diets and, and how their, their habitat and their lifestyle. And I'd sit in his lap and we'd read about them. And I would, I would it, that got the ball rolling. The, 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 oh, wow, their food is it's from the nature. Ours isn't. Ours has all this list of ingredients. What theirs just doesn't. And I'd go down to the to the spring and the brook with with the with the raccoons. They're my favorite. And I'd watch them catch animals. And they'd catch the frogs, catch the crayfish, and they'd just rip into them. But then they'd go and they'd eat berries and they'd eat different kinds of plants, plant life and so forth. And my rats, I, they did the same thing. And everything, they were just so natural, but I wasn't. And so finally, about 10 years old, I came up with my first hypothesis. And I said to my dad, Dad, do you think it's possible that the food that we're eating is killing us? And I said, because we're not eating the same food that our animals are. And when grandma comes home from Africa, they're not eating what we are. And he said, I don't know. I never thought about that. 
And if I went to the doctors, they would always say, this is just who you are. You're going to have to deal with the pain. Oh. And I kept saying, no, but God doesn't make mistakes. And so throughout my life, I just kept searching. And finally, when I went off to college and I could eat what I wanted to eat, I started taking things out of my diet. And the first thing for me was dairy. And that was profound for me. But then I thought, veganism, I'll become a vegan. And so for decades, I was a vegan. And it was great. It was, I, I felt pretty good. Although I still had many digestive problems because I didn't fully quite yet understand my body makeup, my chemistry, my DNA. But so many things started going away. It was just, it was amazing. But then when I hit 50, I decided to become raw vegan. I'll take it to the next level. And at this point, I'm working on my doctorate for, in, in my PhD in, in health and nutrition, thinking I know it all at this point. So I go in for my first colonoscopy. And this was one of the big aha moments. I'm thinking it's going to be pristine. It's going to be squeaky clean. The doctor comes out afterwards. And I said, how was it? And he said, honestly, I can't tell you. And I said, what does that mean? He goes, your entire colon was embedded with nuts and seeds. And he, I said, wait, but how can it be? It's a power food. And he said, I don't know who told you that humans can digest nuts and seeds, but they can't get them out of your diet. Mm. So that, and I really wasn't eating that many because as a vegan, your carbs are your main energy source. You don't want to have too much fat to compete against it. And so I really wasn't eating that much. I thought, how can this be? So that started the question, maybe this isn't the perfect diet. And so then about six years or so into this raw vegan diet, my health really started failing. And my lab work started coming back really bad. And I got a phone call from my doctor and she said, Suze, we think you're dying. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> I didn't feel like I was that sick. <laughs> and she said, you have hardly no white blood, white blood cells. Your blood cells, right? red, white blood cells, platelets are almost deplete. Oh, my. Everything's shutting down on you. I was like, how can it be? So they sent me to an oncologist, human health oncology, and they did all these tests on me. And she came back and she said, Suze, all the cancer doctors here, we can't figure you out. We don't know but we think maybe you have a rare bone marrow cancer. We can't figure out what's wrong with you. But she said, we've never seen anything like the numbers. They're so awful. And then she said, however, I had breast implants at the time. And anyone watching, please girls, don't put breast implants in. Don't put, don't put implants in. It's, it's the worst thing you can do, you'll kill yourself. But anyway, she said, but there's also a very rare cancer that comes with breast implants. And I knew I was having some side effects in the breast implants because I'd had them for 10 years, but I didn't think it would be that. So she said, we could do the bone marrow testing, but the, it's painful, it's horrible. And she said, I know you. And she said, would you treat this cancer if you had, if we diagnose you with it? And I said, no, because I don't think I do. And if I do, I won't treat it. I said, I will heal it naturally. And she said, so then what's the point? We're not going to do the testing. And she said, let's just say you've got cancer. Hmm. And I said, oh. well, you could say that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> and so she, I said, how long are you saying I have to live? She says about 15 years. And I said, okay, thank you. So I left and I was done. And then I immediately went and had my implants taken out. But anyway, so with that said, fast forward to age 60, I go back and now, okay. Oh, so then I meet Sally Norton. And my breast plant surgeon, surgeon, she was also a vegan, but she said, I'm not really a full vegan. And she's a brilliant surgeon. And that's all she does now is remove implants. Hmm. And she said, she looked at all my lab work and she said, my gosh, you're dying. And I said, but I'm not, I'm really not. Let's just get these out of me. I'm not. And she said, I can't. She says, you'll bleed to death. And she says, you have nothing to coagulate. You have nothing. I said, please, you've got to get these out of me. And she said, first of all, she goes, I think you have celiac disease. All your lab work comes out. I said, oh my golly, I never thought of that. <laughs> never thought. And she says, you have to get tested for that. And she said, secondly, she said, you're totally anemic. And she said, but you cannot be a vegan. Your body cannot be. And she says, I'm a vegan, but I eat fish once a week. Nobody can be a vegan. And she said, but you'll never, she says, you have to eat a ton of meat. And I said, oh, Okay. And so then I begged her and she did the implant. She did the explant surgery, but I almost died because I started bleeding to death. I lost 60% of my blood. And afterwards she said, when they brought me to her, she says, 
you have to have a, a blood transfusion. I said, no, no, my body will heal itself. I don't do that. And I did heal myself. <laughs> it took about a year to get my blood back into it, should, but I did. But anyway, so 60 years old, I go in for another colonoscopy. At this point, I met Sally Norton, who got me totally out of the oxalate. She took her about a year to slowly get me off all of these plants I was eating for decades. And all oh, the styes and the, the, all the, uh, the cysts, everything that was coming out of my body was horrible. And mm -hmm. then when I worked with Paul Saladino, who took me from veganism to complete carnivore. <laughs> What a change. What a change, but it was profound. So for a full year, I was a carnivore and I ate about two pounds of, now, now I'm 5'8", and at my sickest, my lowest point, I was 95 pounds, Good. but I was eating 3,000 calories of carbs a day. If I couldn't gain weight, it would come just go through me. Oh my Lord. Yeah. And a lot of like 21 bananas. I mean, I was just eating anything I could. I was starving, just starving all the time. But anyway, so then, so I work with Paul. And for about a year, I was a complete carnivore, two pounds of meat, six raw egg yolks, three ounces of raw kidney and raw liver every day, and about 175 to 200 grams of raw suet, a lot of fat. But I felt great the first couple of months, but then the foot and leg cramps started coming in. <laughs> Everyone's, oh, you got to do the electrolytes. You got to do all these supplements, which I don't believe, but I said, okay, okay, I'll play everyone's game. And I did, and it did nothing, it made me worse. And so I'm talking with Paul because he was, I was client, I was his clients. And I just said, this isn't working for me. There's something not right here. It's it's not right from this, my, my DNA. And he says, well, what are you thinking? At this point, I was really big into my doctorate and so forth. And I said, no, I said, I think the least toxic plants for me would be the avocado and, and the banana. I said, they'll give me the potassium and the magnesium, what I need. And so I did. And it was, oh, it's like, oh, <laughs> profound. And so that's where I am at this point. I mostly meet, but I do, I do have a little bit of the, the least toxic fruit for me. So anyway, 60 years old, I go in for another colonoscopy. Now I'm carnivore. <laughs> I said to my doctor, okay, we've got a complete change here. I'm no longer a vegan, raw vegan, no more nuts and seeds. Let's see. He goes, but you do know that meat's a carcinogen. I said, well, that's what some people say. I have to disagree. So he comes back after, and all the nurses are with him. I'm thinking, oh, this isn't a good sign. There are a whole bunch of people. And I go, how was it? It was the most pristine colon I have ever seen in my life. He goes, for someone in her 60s, he goes, there should be at least a polyp or two. And he goes, you had nothing. He goes, I, I can't believe it. And there's like, what do you eat? I said, me, <laughs> I go, me, what kind? I said, mostly wild bison. And they're like, you mean we can go home and tell our husbands that they can eat red meat? And I go, well, the more the merrier. <laughs> so it just shows you that there's something to this. There is something to this. Yeah. But anyway, so then after doing that for about a year, my lab work started going again. And I started losing more weight. I got up to about 107 and then I started, went down to hundred pounds. My doctor's like, I don't think you can digest me either. And at this point, I was diagnosed with celiac, but that has nothing to do with it. So I, I'd already stopped grains back in my you know, late forties. And so I said, oh my golly, oh my golly, I have no food to eat. I have nothing else to eat. What am I going to live on? He, I, I, he goes, I don't know. So I prayed and I prayed. And then I was brought to Chris Kenobi's first video that I saw him on. It was the low carb Denver video that he had. And I watched that so many times and I found I couldn't find anything I could find on him. Brought tears. I, I was crying and sobbing. And my daughter, one of my daughters walked in and I said, this is the most profound video I've ever seen. He's showing that the, the Maasai who are so high, it's basically carnivore. And I said, and then you've got the Tukasina and the, and the Tokalaos and all these, the, you've got in the middle, some are just, they're eating some fish and they're eating coconuts. Then you've got the, some eating like 90% of their diet is sweet potatoes. And I said, they all work, but what's the one thing that they all have in common? Seed oils. But although I haven't had seed oils most of my life. But anyway, I said, but we can live on any kind of diet. I said, it's just how we're going to, we have to find what's best for each of our DNA. And so I I prayed and I, I, I emailed him and my daughter's like, he's so busy. He's not going to email you back. In three hours, he emailed me back. And I said, what do you eat? And he told me. And then he kind of guided me along. And then we became best of buddies, best of friends. 
And he realized my background has been nothing but research since I was like five. I've been researching with my dad about what's what's the proper nutrient, what's the proper species diet? What, what are we supposed to live in? And my grandma taught me what how the Native American, how the um, Africans are eating. And so then we got together and we we locked ourselves in for months and months. And when I say that months and months and months, we would talk to our children every once in a while, but we didn't really see anyone. The only time we would leave the house would be to go get groceries every 10 days. And it was very quick. And then we would hunker back into, and we would work 24 seven for months and months and months researching and writing. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen that we did that. And so here we are now. And now we're getting ready to go for our first expedition. So wow. that's my story. <laughs> yeah. So we're roughly the same age, I guess. I remember when they introduced Tang. Uh, <laughs> and also, remember space food sticks? Do you remember those? Yes. Oh. <laughs> oh, my God. My mom put those in my lunch because good moms did good things like that for their kids. And I mean, kids will eat most any junk food, but even the space food sticks was too far for me. Oh. I remember yeah. that well. But you didn't, didn't, did you, Jack, did you ever find Captain Crunch like, would burn my mouth? It was just so much sugar. It was literally, I felt my, but like, the roof of my mouth was raw. Eating oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. That Captain Crunch was one of those weird experiences. Like <laughs> part of me said more, more, but it was such an unpleasant experience yes. to eat it. That's it. Um, yeah. It was very, very strange. Yeah. We could sit here and reminisce about old days. But I started that sentence with a thought that has now escaped my mind. Oh, go ahead, Phil. Yeah, I was just going to jump in and, and the intuition as a child about the species appropriate diets. And you're exactly right. We know and we study the species appropriate diet for every species except ourselves, basically. That's it. And the funny thing is, I remember holding my raccoons. And, oh. They're just the most beautiful things. Oh, please. I, oh, they were just. My brother they, had raccoon. Oh, God. Didn't you, you didn't love them? What annoying yeah. animal. Oh, they were just so Oh, dear beautiful. God. They're so smart and so dexterous. Oh, I know. So they were, they were mischievous. They were into everything. God, yes. <laughs> but they would put their little hands on your face. <laughs> oh, my God. I just love them so. Oh. But I have to speak <laughs> language and they could speak mine and they I mean they just taught me so much of life and I would sit and hold them and I would, and they did when I was crying I was so the pain was so awful and I would just hold them mm. and and I would just say oh, you're never sick and their teeth were so beautiful and everything they were just so full of life and I was so sick and I just knew I knew there was something about their food and then to have my grandma talk about with the native with the, the africans and when she told me that their dessert one night when she was first entering the tribe and she had to sit with the chief and eat at his table and she told all about the food that they were eating and they had meat and they had tubers and she said but then they were getting ready to serve dessert she says i think it was a dessert and everyone's getting excited and she said i'm thinking what could it be and she says and out in front they put this big platter with this head of a freshly decapitated monkey. And the top of the head had been cut off and the brain was exposed. And she, and she said, they handed me this, it looked like it was kind of a wooden spoon. And they're all like, <laughs> I go, did you eat it? And she goes, you have to, because otherwise I slapped to the chief's integrity. And it's like, oh, and she, and she said, I said, how was it? And she goes, it really wasn't that bad. She goes, really? It wasn't that bad. She goes, it was warm, still body temperature. It was freshly killed. I was, oh. <laughs> but so those are the things that I was just marveling at because I thought, this is what humans eat, not what we're eating. These people are living from the earth and they were so beautiful. They're just absolutely so full of, and I said, grandma, did you see did any of your children? Because she was teaching them. Are they sick? She said, no, they're not sick at all. And that's when you just say what we live is so wrong. We don't know how to be humans. We don't. We have to be taught. And so we have to go back to our roots. We have to go back to what we used to do. This moving forward thing. And now we've got the let's some grow some meat in a in a uh, institution someplace. No, thank you. God doesn't make mistakes. We're, we're designed to eat certain things. And so my grandmother used to always, she's part Native American. And she said, watch nature. It will always answer all your questions. And so I'm always watching and I'm always, I live in nature. I'm always up in trees. I'm always just out in nature because that's where we need to be. 
And, and it's even like with the raccoons with their hands, there's scientists right that are trying to figure out, do they just do it because they're clean or do they do it because on their fingers, like we have, because they're not equating it to us, only equating to, to, to raccoons, but I think it's with us too. Is it because they have sensors in their hands and that sensing helps them to sense their surroundings and what's in their food, they're sensing their food. And I remember watching my raccoons, they would always do that. And so I started emulating them and I started doing the same thing with my food. And I do the same thing now. I use my hands to eat. And with my granddaughter, I'll say, honey, put your silverware down. Use your hands. And, and it's just so, if you haven't done it, guys, it's so, I don't know. It just, it's more enjoyable. You just get more out of the food. It's just so something. But it's the same thing when I'm outside. I don't wear shoes. I, I'm always crawling. I'm always barefoot. And, and it just it's, it makes you come alive. And they did a research in Japan years ago. And it's called tree bathing, wood bathing, going into the forest bathing. And there's phytoncides, the actual wonderful chemicals in trees and plants that they give off, that they have actually done research and proven this. And I believe it with all my heart and soul, that it will heal people with cancer, depression. If we go in and we're breathing in and we're in them. And of course, I just climb and I just, I just lay in the trees because it's just so... I just get so much out of that. But the, again, the raccoons, I go back to the raccoons and all the animals that we had, they taught me how to live. And we have to do that, guys. We have to go back to living as we're designed to do. Take the shoes off, go out and crawl around, haul around some logs, these kinds of things, because it's, it's 62. I feel I run, I sprint faster. I lift more. I, everything I do is profound. My granddaughter, is the same. she says, grandma, she likes me to race me on her bike and I outrun her every time. She said, how can you be an old lady and be so fast? And I just said, because I'm not old. I said, that's just a number, you know, and I plan on living to at least 125. What um, amazes me about this is my mom is 83, I want to say, 83. And you never know it, but that's, but I look at her life and by and large, other than I mean, she's had some issues, but by and large, she's been relatively healthy most of her life. She's had some structural issues, some joint issues, but otherwise she is smarter than most people you ever run into, sharp as a tack, feisty and healthy and blah, 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 blah. And I expect you'll be that way at 83, but you weren't that way at all for, it sounds like the first 50 years of life. Oh, it was. And it's exciting to see that it can be turned around. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing is, I wasn't really eating. I've never been a processed food person. I don't like sweets. They make me feel like I'm going to throw up all the time. So I've never been a sweets person, but I just, I think it was just so much, even though I was eating whole foods, I wasn't eating them correctly. When you look at, the, and I remember asking grandma, did they cook their food? And she said, plants, they had special, they always, plants were never eaten raw. They would always prepare them in a certain way. And that's part of what we'll talk about when we talk about the expedition. That's part of my, part of the thing I want to find out when we're going. And I want to ask you about your mom. What kind of food did, when, when she was growing up, because she grew up in the era that they would have not really had too many seed oils until more recently when they were really inundating our food sources. What was what do you think most of her life was in eating food? Well, she grew up in central Oklahoma. I know Crisco and margarine were part of the table all the time. But in central Oklahoma, especially then, we all ate beef. We ate beef that was grown within miles of our house. Oh, God, you were blessed. Oh. Um, but... From what I've learned over these last couple of years with Phil, we weren't eating particularly healthy, at least in terms of what I know today. What I do know is that we had far fewer choices to eat poorly than we have today. Mm -hmm. We had chips, we had ding-dongs. I think I had a ding-dong in, in every school lunch for a while. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, ultimately, I would say, and, and by the way, I've met Jack's mother and, and can attest uh, what amazing uh, woman she is. But I think it's kind of the balance because, yeah, you had some of that junk food, 
but you were eating nutrient dense beef for the ma- really the majority of your meals. And as a child, certainly, I think we have enough, hopefully, we used to at least, maybe this isn't true anymore, but you have enough activity and, and stuff to kind of balance some of that stuff. As long as it's not the majority of your diet, like it's unfortunately become today. Absolutely. Well put. Absolutely. My mom, she's 91 and she's blind with macular degeneration. Mm. And again, my dad's dead. Why? For not, I mean, riddled with cancer. We don't need these things. It it doesn't exist where they're living ancestrally. These things don't exist. And this is what we need to get back to. We need to say to people, they need to understand the truth and, and we're truth seekers. And that's what Chris and I are out to do. We just, we, we want to prove that this is what's still happening. Although in my research to prepare for this expedition in booking and scheduling everything, I fear that I think some of our toxic food is infiltrating these beautiful people. And if I can at least even go and teach them to go back, but I'm hoping, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the work that you and Chris are doing. Talk about the Ancestral Health Foundation and this expedition that you guys are about to uh, set off on. Well, Phil, thank you. Well, we have two foundations. We have the Cure AMD Foundation, and we also have the Ancestral Health Foundation. So we have two. And eventually, once we can get ourselves not, not moving all the time, we, we will have a, a website available for Ancestral Health Foundation. But we do have a full website I've been working for quite a few years um, at AMD, and um, that's where if anyone's interested in donating and helping us to cover the costs of of these expeditions, we would greatly appreciate that and that we have a donation page on that website. Um, Again, that's QAMD.org. And this website, the expedition we're going on right now, that's being funded by a a few people. And also Chris and I, we're we're putting our our own money into it as well because it's expensive, but it's so worth it. Every dollar we feel could save a life. And you've got the cancer, you've got the breast cancer, you've got the AMD, you've got all these different foundations all over the world. But this is for every chronic disease that we can think of that this could prevent and heal. And so really, guys, if you have someone that's ailing from some chronic disease, if you could just spare a dime or two and help us because the next expedition after this one we're doing now, and this is not the intense one. This is our first time to go and get our feet wet to figure out what we have to do. So where are you going? What are you doing? Okay, Jason, stop rambling. Big picture stuff here, but all right. So here it is. So tomorrow I leave, and Chris is already in Melbourne, Australia, and he was there for the low carb down under convention last week. So I'm going to meet him. I'll be there on our Saturday, but their Sunday, and then we're going to fly out from there. And we're going to fly to um, our first place will be in Papua New Guinea, but also on the western side of, it's called Jayapura. We're going to start there. And that's not as rural, it's rural, but not as rural as we're going to go from there. And so when we first get there, that's going to be where we're, it's kind of, they're, they're calling it more like a city, but it's not like a city where we would think. It's still quite rural. But we're hoping we don't see like the McDonald's and the Kentucky Fried Chickens and all those things there, which they may be. And we're going to be out, but this, we're not doing lab work. We're not doing any blood work. We're not doing any adipose tissue. We're not doing anything like that because we don't have the finances for that yet. It's just, it's, it's going to take a lot, but what we're going to do is we're going to go and collect data in terms of have seed oils, have processed foods infiltrated there. And do we, are, are we seeing seeding rates of obesity? Are we seeing sick people? We're going to do a lot of interviewing. We're going to go to restaurants and ask what they're cooking with because we've been told, oh no, it's only coconut oil, only coconut oil. Then why am I seeing in my research so much obesity and, and so many diseases cre- creeping in over there? I don't know. And then we're going to be going to the stores. Are we going to see shelves lined with all the bottles like we have? And then we're going to fly in a little tiny plane to a place called Wamina. It's in the Balium Valley. It's up in the highlands. And there's a tribe there. They're called the Denny or the Denai tribe. And I had some pictures. I didn't know Jack, you wanted to show. They're just beautiful people. But anyway, so with that said, so we're going to spend about four days with them. And we have a, a guy that's going to take us that will speak the language. And I've asked him things that I wanted to know since I was a little girl. And if we could do with them, with, that they could ask if they will do with us and teach us. And I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> it's a surprise. <laughs> 
<laughs> so anyone if, who you're watching, if you want to know um, and, and watch us, um, there they are. <laughs> Aren't they sure, beautiful? Yeah. Aren't these, these are their warriors. Well, they don't look like they're suffering from the standard American diet. I'll say no, are they not? Are they beautiful? They're just beautiful. Good Lord. Look at the, look at the width of their jaws. I mean, everything. Yeah. You know? So uh, these are the things I really want to look. This is where? Papua New Guinea? This is in Papua New Guinea, but more the Indonesia side. And it's called Wamina. And again, I'll be posting every day when we have cell service, because these are pretty remote locations. So we'll have to walk a couple miles to get into where their villages are. And the things that I'm hoping that they're going to show us, that they're going to teach us, will be so profound. And I wanted to know most of my life, and I'm going to get the answers there. But I've got tons and tons of questions. If you guys have questions and things that you want me to ask them while I'm there, you can post some guys or, or Jack, Phil, you guys can just ask me before I go. But I've got a whole list of things I want to ask them. Um it's it's, it's going to be amazing, and and I'm I, I was studying dentistry at one point because I wanted to be a, a pediatric dentist, and I want to ask if I can look in their mouths because <laughs> I think that's really an indication of also our health is our teeth. Yep. And, um, yeah, I want to look at their hair. I want to look at their nails. Um, and there's a story that goes behind this tribe. It's absolutely. It tells you the beauty of what they feel about their families. I think that's another key thing to help is um, our connection to our loved ones that when a loved one passes, that they cut off a finger is it an honor of them. And it's just things that we would never think of doing, the love that they have. And maybe that's missing too in our country. But anyway, so that will be that tribe. And then we fly to Honiara, Solomon Islands. And um, there, again, now we're in the heart of the thick of um, the Pacific Islands. And we'll spend about three or four days there and uh, doing the same thing. It's always the same thing we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be going into where they call their cities to see what the people are like there. We'll be interviewing them, going into their stores, going into their restaurants, going into their markets and seeing what kind of things that they're selling in their markets. Cause they have beautiful, huge markets, especially in Honiara. I've heard it's amazing, this massive market where they're gonna have all their fresh coconuts and all the fruits that they pick. They will have their wild boar and their pigs and um, their fish, all those kinds of things. And then we're going to go into the more rural where we're going to see the people who are still living, hopefully, their traditional ways. And then after spending time in Honiara and Solomon in that region, we're going to then fly to Samoa. We're going to seven places at all. And in Samoa, same thing there. We'll be doing the exact same thing, but we're hoping because that's when you think of Samoans, at least I do, they're some of the supposed to be some of the tallest human beings. Well, they are, you know, as a longtime watcher of the NFL, <laughs> Samoans, just, <laughs> my understanding of Samoans, they just seem to be just bigger. That's it. Taller, and wider, thicker, yes. stronger. Yes. Yeah, and that's <laughs> always been my thing. I want to go and see, I'm sure it's, there's some DNA involved here, but I want to see what is it that they're eating? What do these people eat? Because I do believe that that has something to do I mean, I'm tall for a female, and I know that my father was always big that you have to eat, have dairy, got have dairy, and he loved me, but so, and I, we ate that, we did have a lot of that on top of the junk food, but anyway, so I can't wait, Jack, that's I said to Chris, Samoa is, is a given because we've got to see, is the stature still happening, or are, is there, are they slowly oh, shrinking? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's, there's so much to look at, to look forward to. Then, after that, we're going to fly to Vanuatu. And um, Vanuatu is, again, it's all these things we wrote about in the book. And um, we're going to go spend time there. But then one of my favorite things we're going to do is, if you ever saw the movie called Tana, it's a, a small island uh, near Van Vanuatu. And it's got a tribe there. And it's all about, the, this movie is all about this tribe. So we're going to fly there. And we're going to go and stay with this tribe for a while and, and learn about them. And hopefully nothing is infiltrated there. And then after that, we'll fly to Fiji where there are a couple um, ancestral villages that have been living there for two millennium. And hopefully they're, they haven't been infiltrated as well. And that will be our last stop before we come back. So it's three weeks we'll be gone. Wow. Okay. Remind us of the name of the book. Okay. This is the name of our book, The Ancestral Diet Revolution. And if I recall, there's two volumes? No, no. Chris wrote no? another 
No, oh, this, okay. it probably should have been because it's very well, long. Amazon has it referenced as it volume. Does. It volume says two. that. I think what they're saying, I think there's meaning. It, so we, we, we battled back and forth with them about that. We've been asking, can we just reword that we've got it in four different, and Jack, I'm going to put that up. There is one slide towards the end that shows the, the four different versions we have of it, uh, which would be the hardcover, which is full color. I'll wait till Jack brings that up. I mean, Phil, bring that up. Thank you. Doing our best. Towards the end. Yeah. 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 You can all see, see, we've got the hardcover is full color. Then the, the paperback comes in full color and black and white. I would uh. definitely say do not purchase the black and white because the, we have a, over 180 graphs and charts and pictures and so forth in this book. And it, it, the black and white just does not do it justice. It makes it very difficult to really interpret. But if you really want to save money, the ebook, I worked so hard. This is like a once in a lifetime book that will ever happen because it was, they kept saying it couldn't be done. And I said, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> you don't know who you're working with. I will make this work because I wanted to make sure that every single picture and every single diagram and so forth could be linkable from whatever we wrote in the book, if I said, see figure so-and-so while we're writing, you can click right on it. It will take you right to that diagram or picture and not have to search for them and then take you back to where you want to go. And it hasn't been done in a book with this many, I mean, usually they'll have five or six pictures or something in, in a book like this, but not something like this. So it's like a once in a lifetime book to get on, on an ebook and it's very reasonable, very, very cheap. So that's the route I would go. But if you want really to me, a piece that's to, to keep on a coffee table. It's the hardcover. It's beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah, it is. It really is an amazing book, uh, both in content and design. And Chris did such an excellent job on that. So the trip, I mean, it, it just obviously sounds amazing and very much in the kind of traveling in the footsteps of, of Weston A. Price and the seminal work that he did back in the 1920s. And it really will be interesting to kind of see the updates, because like you said, it's hard to imagine parts of the world where the Western diet, the Western foods haven't uh, got into yet. They're just so ubiquitous throughout the world these days. So being able to find little pockets where it truly hasn't gotten to because that's that's a gold mine in terms of research because it's so rare uh, so, so. In, in, in you know in, in, as an educator I will educate them if I see that it is coming there it's infiltrating I, I will share with them I'm going to show them pictures of what sickness will look like and what they have to look forward to <laughs> and please don't do this and I'm trying I want to educate the world too because when I'm researching I'm seeing so many tourists are going over and they're bringing lollipops and candy bars and thinking that this is really swell and that they're going to love these things. Don't do it. Please, people, don't bring them toxic food. We don't want, no, they don't need this. We need to bring what they're eating to us. That's the gift. And so if we can educate them and stop this before it gets any worse, that's another goal. So, yeah. Are you familiar with the work of Peter Dadamo? Yes. I wanted to to ask you to let's just comment explain what dadamo's thesis is and if and how that dovetails with your work i think all of us i think we're all this is i talk to chris about all the time i said i feel like everyone thinks that we're all against each other you get the vegans the, the paleo the keto the carnivore everyone's thinking that we all have some different platform some different idea when we're all searching for the truth. And I never want to, I don't want to ever compare or go against what anyone else is saying. I think we all have a point. Did you ever see the movie, The Point? It was a long, long time ago, Jack. It was not ringing a bell. Oh, not, really not. Young. And it was all very much about this. And it was a, a cartoon. It was all about this little boy that just felt he didn't have a point because everyone in the village had a point, but he didn't. Oh, I remember, remember that one? Yes. Do you remember? And it, it stuck with me because it's so true. We all have a point. And I just feel that if we could all work together instead of working against each other, and, and it makes me so sad to see on, on social media, everyone going against each other, making fun of people and, and saying, look at these people. We're not doing, it's hurting. It's hurting people. We have to stop being so mean. 
And we have to just say, we all have a point. We're just trying to survive and we're trying to find healing. If you're a vegan, you're trying to find the right thing. If you're a carnivore, wherever we are, we're trying to find the right answer. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, it becomes a religious argument. Rather yes, than yes, a absolutely. Jack. I agree. And why can't we all just work together and just say, let's just find the truth. And that's all Chris and I want to do. If, if, and I said to Chris, I, I thought that veganism was the greatest thing in the world. I'm like, gosh, that's, this is it. And I always told my followers, I always said, I'm a guinea pig. I don't know the answers. And I said, I will tell you the truth. I will be so transparent. I will never lie to you. And they watched my whole journey. They watched my whole journey. I was very blunt about everything I was doing. And so I would never say I'm right. Even now, and I said this to Chris, I said, what if 10 years from now we find out it's not seed oils? What if it's something else? And I said, we have to be complete transparent. This is what we believe now. Right. But I said, but 10 years from now, we may have some new test or something that comes out and shows it's something totally different. But for now, this is what we believe. This is what science is showing us. We're very science related. We're not just guessing. And so I think that that's the point. We have to just really be honest and upfront and say, right now, this is what we believe it is. But we're going to keep searching and we're going to keep turning over every stone. And it may not be found out for another 50, 100 years. Who knows? You may not know until we all enter the kingdom. It is fascinating to think that on the one hand, you've got the Maasai who basically eat nothing but yes. bread and meat. And, and then the entire spectrum. And these folks are not suffering from the kinds of, I guess, what we call lifestyle diseases that we deal with here in the West. I ask about Dadamo because my, my doctor is a big fan of Dadamo's work. And for our listeners, he wrote the book, Eat for Your Type. The thesis is that your blood type indicates the foods that are more appropriate for your body. And that, I guess, has, there must be some genetic, some evolutionary pressures there in that direction. My wife and I were sitting on the patio this morning watching sunrise. And I'm a type O, she's a type A, according to Dadamo. She doesn't need to be eating all the red fatty meat that I love. Um, and we were just talking about it. And the reality is, I just don't know. It, I've it, learned I, that I eat what makes me feel good and I don't eat what makes me not feel good. But, <laughs> but, I, but I do not. And I, that's one of the questions I'm going to ask. I'm going because I yeah. do think that there is some, I do believe there is some to it. But I don't, again, I don't know. I'm A positive. My father was O. And he was a meat eater. Oh my golly, was he a meat eater. But he, we, we also were, lived in the mountains and he was a hunter and this, and I was not really that much of a meat eater. I never really had been until now, but yet here I'm A positive and I'm eating a lot of meat now. So I don't know. And I know a lot of carnivores that are A, a type. And I know a lot of vegans that are O. So I don't know. I don't know, but I really, and I said this to Chris, I said, you know, when we start doing the blood work, I really can't wait. I mean, can't think about it. Oh, good. That. I was hoping, what? I was going to ask if you're doing blood work. Well, oh, not this time because we can't afford that. But uh. eventually that's our dream. We're hoping come 2024, we want to do our world tour <laughs> to go to the Maasai and the Inuit and all the places. But again, we have to raise the money. It's going to take money. And we don't have that kind. I'm a retired teacher. <laughs> I live off of not much, but I don't care. I'm very simple. I'm very simple. But- my dream. And also, probably the world's greatest grandmother from what, oh my gosh. <laughs> I just love, oh my baby girl. She's like, grandma, you know, you, what if something happens to you? What if you die? What if you get, you know, eaten by an animal or something? I said, you know what, honey? I said, great, what a great way to die. I'm trying to save people's lives. I would give my life for anyone. But what about me? Who's going to sing to me at nighttime? <laughs> I said, I'll sing to you from heaven, honey. I will always be there. But anyway, Jack, I'm hoping that when we do the blood work, can you imagine the Maasai if you come back and many of them are, oh, what, what if? I mean, just what if? Yeah. And what if the people who are, the Tukacenta, who are eating mostly sweet potatoes, what if they're mostly A-type? And what if it is a genetic? What if it's a, but these are the, it's, it's so exciting to think what we're going to find out. But it takes money. And again, we have to do this. But I mean, I do. I mean, I, I remember when I was working on my doctorate, that was one of the things that people were talking about. What if it is a blood type thing? What if it is? But I don't know. And so I try not to, to jump on anyone's bandwagon. I just want to find the truth. 
And so I think when we go to stay with these people that are living like we were designed to live, we're going to find some answers. We really will. I really think so. So I just want to make sure I'm clear on your story. You, <laughs> you bounced back and forth from never been much of a sweets eater, but decided to go vegetarian and then vegan. Did that for a long time found out that it wasn't making you healthier and possibly making you sicker, switched to full-on carnivore with the help of the king of the carnivores, <laughs> and have modified that. Yes. And so for me, and I think this might, I tell my clients when they come to me, what do we do? I said, we can listen to everybody, but the only body that knows is your own body. And so you have to listen. It's giving us signals all the time. If you feel pain in your hand, you feel pains in your feet, in your hips, in your joints. If you can't see well, there's something wrong. Here's an interesting thing. Yeah. I had a mass in my left breast for years and they're watching. I wouldn't do it. I, I didn't, did not, I do not do the um, mammograms. I only do sonograms and they didn't know what it was. They just kept watching it. And I kept thinking, I wonder if it's oxalates. Could it be oxalates? And finally, when I took out all the oxalates, two years later, it's gone. I don't know, but so again, but I don't have the axle. I Phil, is it called axle defector? Is that the name of the microbe that I think I, I always get them wrong? If Chris were well, in the yeah, bifido, I, I stumble on the full name too, but yeah, part of the microbiome as to whether or not you can digest, metabolize, get rid of effectively clear oxalates from your system or not. Yeah. And uh, this one is, I think it's called axlobifact or something like that. Yeah. I don't have, I tested myself. I have nothing of that, but Chris has got a ton of it. And again, I'm wondering in our research, is it, do, do these places like the Tukacenta and the Tokelauans, do they have more oxalobifactor than what we have? Is glyphosate killing off our oxalobifactor and therefore we're all struggling with oxalates now. I don't know, but these are all the things I want to answer because I think something's not right. Something's off. And these are all the questions I'm going to be asking. These are all the tests we want to run. It's, it's so marvelous to think that we have the opportunity to potentially answer questions that could solve so many diseases and so many problems that people are just riddled with. So, so how do you, because we have a little bit of a, to reconcile, we started off by talking about species appropriate diets. And you look at whatever species in the wild, and they pretty much eat the same thing. And now we've kind of evolved towards, well, humans, maybe we all have whatever it is, our blood type, genetics, microbiome, that we're not going to be able to eat, that there isn't one ideal diet for us all to eat. How do you kind of reconcile those two ways of thinking? Interesting you said that. If you give a deer the food it would normally eat in the winter, in the summer, it will die. Same thing if you give it what it would eat in the summer, in the winter, it will die. They have different microbiomes. And we should too. There have been studies done with certain tribes like the Hads and the Maasai that in the wet season, they have a certain microbiome. And in the dry season... And in, in, I think it's the dry, one of the seasons, there's hardly no microbiome. There's hardly no gut back bacteria in there. It's deplete, but then it proliferates and it gets more in the opposite season. So I think there's so much to this. So I, I think that they talk about seasonal eating and my grandmother always said that she said she had a big garden and we would go out and we would pull things and she would pull things out of the garden and she'd say, eat it with the dirt. I'm like, grandma. And she said, eat the dirt. And she says, it's loaded with germs. I'm like, germs? And she said, good germs. And this is before we knew anything. This is my grandmother was already telling me. But it's because that Native American thing, and, our, and she was living also with the tribes. She understood. We have to get dirty. And, and so she, she said, you have to eat what seasonally. We don't have these things all the time. Even in this, I can't wait to go to when, when we're going to be in the tropics. I want to ask them, do these grow all the time or are they seasonal? Like do coconuts grow 365 days a year or is there a season for them? Just like avocados, we know that there's a season. Oranges, there's a season. They don't, even in Florida, they don't grow. They, they have a certain point where they don't really grow that much. 
And so I want to know that if that's the case, then we shouldn't be eating these things every day. Just like with meat, and we talk about the organs. Everyone's saying you gotta have all these organs. You got, and I love liver and, and raw kidney. I do. But I don't eat them like I used to because now we know. Think about it. And I remember I said to grandma when she was telling me what they would eat when, in her tribes that she lived with, she never mentioned they were eating a ton of organs. Never talked about that. It wasn't all the time. And I don't think that we would be eating meat every day because if you're hunting it, I don't think you're gonna be successful every day. So it's not an everyday thing. And when we look back in the early 1900s of when we were, when the United States was really healthy, I, I don't believe that they would be eating all the time. Like, I don't believe that we have all this, that we didn't have three, six, we didn't have refrigerators. We couldn't have been eating all those things. We didn't have fruit. So again, I think we have to think about, again, nature. And I know that in the animal world, my raccoons and so forth, they they weren't eating all the time. They, they, they're they going to go into like a hibernated state and they're, they're not going to be eating. But I think if you are a hibernating animal, you stop eating. <laughs> so you, you've got that downtime. But they didn't. They did not eat the same thing all the time. They're always scavenging and scouring, scavenging for things. And I think it's the same thing with humans. We have to stop thinking just because everything is so easily accessible. Does it make it right? Does it make it right? I don't know if eating... When I was eating two pounds of meat a day and 200 grams of fat a day, I don't think that's natural. I don't because I, I my body started rejecting it. Yeah. So I think, again, for, for anyone listening, I think, listen to your body. It tells us everything. It tells us. That is really fascinating that you say that because one of the things that has become blindingly obvious over the two and a half years that we've been doing this show to me is how much of pharmacology is devoted to, for all intents and purposes, making us numb to the signals our bodies are given. Most of it, it appears to me as a layman, an interested layman, but a layman nonetheless, that most of what the drugs that the pharmacists gives us do is just suppress the irritation of symptoms. It masks everything. And what you're saying is our bodies have a wisdom. I mean, this is real earth mother stuff and I dig <laughs> it. Don't get me wrong. But our bodies have a wisdom and it is as if all of modern life conspires to numb us to the signals that our body gives. We have artificial lighting, so we don't have to be subjected to our natural circadian rhythms. We have artificial heating and cooling, don't, so we don't have to be subjected to natural heating and cooling. And by the way, as a resident of Phoenix, Arizona, it's 102 degrees on October. Really? 19th. Oh, Let me I tell you, I'm really <laughs> pleased. For, I'm glad we've got, anyway. But yeah, that's just a fascinating thought that to, to view what is your modern life doing to you to insulate you from the signals of your own body. Absolutely. That's the message I'm taking away from today. Absolutely. And that's the first thing whenever a client comes to me, I just say, tell me how you feel. What does your head feel? What do your eyes feel? What do your hands feel? What do your fingers? Everything. What do you feel throughout your entire body? And they're like, I never thought about it. And those yeah. all tell you something. They tell you everything you need to know. I mean, if I wake up in the morning and I have any kind of an ache or pain, I have to ask myself, what did I eat? What did I do that caused this? Because it's not natural for me. I mean, at 62 years old, I can now do a split. My whole life, I've tried to do split. And my ballet teachers were like, your hips pop out of their joints. You can't, you'll never do one. And don't tell me can't because it's going to make me work even harder. But I thought, okay, by the time I'm 62, this shed, that that's my goal. I will do a split. And I'm doing splits now. You know, I mean, I'm as limber, I'm, I'm more limber than I've ever been. So it's not age. It's our mind. Our brain can do anything, guys. Our brains can heal us. Our faith, my faith is my ultimate. That's what saves me. I mean, I, every doctor I've ever gone to when they know I've lived through it and I was married to a very abusive alcoholic drug addict and just going through that alone was awful. And that should have killed me. And he tried to kill me many times, but <laughs> that should kill me. But every time I go in and even my cancer doctor, she said, 80% of my patients are women with breast cancer. And she says, every single one of them have gone through trauma. And she said, you should be dead. And I said, no, my faith. I know that God's never, he's not ready to take me yet. 
I should have died three times in my life so far. At two, I should have died. At 15, I should have died. And at 57, I should have died with massive blood loss. And every time, God saved me because he has a plan. And I will see, I will do, I will solve that plan. And I know what that plan is and it's coming up soon. And we just want to heal everyone. We want everyone to just no more. We, are, we should all be done with all this. The, the disease of greed, that's what I call this. I wrote it in the book. The disease of greed is the pharmaceutical companies and the big food companies. They don't care. They're about making money. They don't care about what you feel. They don't care how you, nothing. And so we're here to stop that. We have to stop all this insanity. And let's be honest and let's be human. That's it. Well, that's a great place to pause and say thank you for being here. So the book is The Ancestral Diet Re Revolution by Chris Kanabi and Suzanne Alexander. It is, in fact, available on Amazon. I know because I found it yesterday. <laughs> How do folks support you again? What's the contact for that? The contact would be in Phil, it's the last slide. I believe it's the last slide if you want to throw that up if you have time. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram, on Twitter, on YouTube. And just, and also on our website of cureamd.org and soon Ancestor Health Foundation. And here it is. There we are. And so, so there's cureamd.org. What is yes. AMD? Um, Age related macular degeneration. That's what my mom is blind from. And was it Chris who talked about this macular degeneration yes, book? He's, yeah. He's an yeah. He's I've not, been he's trying either. to remember. I met a guy in Mexico uh, a couple of weeks ago who's dealing with macular degeneration. And I said, we had a guest on who talked about this. Yes. Who was it? Where was the book? I've just gone completely blank. Yes. I had a patient, I had a client contact me. I, a lot of them do up with this because AMD and just said, I have AMD. And they said, I'm, it's getting wet. I'm turning into wet. The druids are turning wet, which is not a good sign. And what can I do? And I told her what to do. And I said, just follow this. And I said, I promise you, you'll see reversal. It's not too late. And about a month later, she had stopped everything. And she came back and she said, I went back to my doctor. And she said, he's seen reversal already. And I said, it's profound. I said, our bodies can heal. I said, don't let anyone tell you any otherwise. And she was just like, oh my gosh, I just can't believe this. And there's so many stories. There's so many stories, you guys. And it's just the most beautiful thing. Money can't put, you can't put a cost on this to see people healing. And that's just been my goal my whole life. I don't want to see people suffering to watch my dad die. Such a horrible death. It was just awful. And I don't want anyone to suffer. So we can do this. We can all gain, join together, guys, and let's make it work and make it just happen. Make it work. All right. Well, Suzanne Valle con Dios, God go with you too here's hoping for just the best possible outcomes for you and chris on Thanks. this trip and uh, phil let's have them both back when they get back oh yeah, he's definitely. so much fun oh you guys we'd yeah, we'd be great to <laughs> great to hear all about it and really looking forward to all of the amazing research that i think is going to come out of this and so yeah Hope it's a, a great trip and fruitful. And for our audience, please go support this cause. Because like Suzanne said, this isn't about curing or fixing one disease. This is really about fixing them all. And let's support that great cause. And, and I just can't thank you guys enough. You're, you're part of our warrior team. And, and Phil, you, know, you, you were right there at, from the start when the book came out. You were one of our first readers. And I just appreciate you guys so much for all that you do. And you're just such gifts from God and you're our angels. And I just, I, I just hold you in my prayers every day. And I'm just so grateful. And, and everyone out there watching, um, thank you. You're all, we're just so grateful that you're there too. And follow along with us. I'll try to post every day and teach you something new. And if you've got questions, everyone just ask me and I'll see if I can get them answered by our beautiful people that are living out in the real world. Thanks so much, Suzanne. Thank you, guys. So for Suzanne Alexander and Dr. Philip Ovedia, this has been the Stay Off My Operating Table podcast. We'll talk to you all next time. Bye, guys. Chances are you wouldn't be listening to this podcast if you didn't need to change your life and get healthier. So take action right now. Book a call with Dr. Ovedia's team. One small step in the right direction is all it takes to get started. Contact us at 
ifixhearts.com slash talk. That's ifixhearts.com slash talk.